We're consulting. It's happened for an awful lot of And just a quick start, rest services with Grail. All right. So, again, all the stuff. Some nice coverage of REST and things like that. So what is REST? REST technically stands for Representational State Transfer. This comes from some guy's doctoral dissertation, so it's full of academic jargon um, on purpose. It's an architectural style and a bunch of constraints for client-server communication. And there's a whole list of things, like it's client-server, it's stateless, it's cacheable, things like that. But it's basically a way to communicate for application to application. Um, HTTP is definitely a lot simpler. There's a paper by a guy named Roy Fielding, and you can read the paper, but it is totally dense with abstract concepts. So go ahead, read it if you want, but I would recommend not <laughs> in general. Um, when you use REST for APIs, the whole idea is to make a simple, lightweight API that's not that hard to use, not that hard to code, is kind of the whole idea. And the basic idea is give me back the row or object that refers to this ID. You can also add search parameters, so like get me everyone whose last name is Johnson in the system or something like that. Um, but that's kind of the basic part of the API. Delete, HTTP method delete will remove an object or row by its ID. Post will create a new object or row. Put will update an existing object or row, but there's a whole bunch of arguments in there on the academic side of these things. You can use put to create some new object, and the goal of using REST is to make a simple API, so whatever works for you, I guess. REST is really based on the concept of resources, and a resource is an object in the system. Think of like a row in a database is probably the simplest thing. That's a resource. A resource identifier is what you use to find information about that resource. I want to see the company whose ID is 2, employee 50. You can go as nested deep as you want. Usually that makes your APIs much more complicated, though. So here's an example of a GET request. So if you do company slash 5, and you ask for, say, JSON as your output, you might get the top example there. Format is JSON. If you ask for, like, an XML output, you'll see XML there. And again, I made my objects very, very simple for this stuff, so they're not all too complicated. It's easier to understand for the examples. So that's basically if you pass an ID. For inserting data, your post usually inserts a new row. So here's an example using the curl command. You just blast that at like your Grails app, and it'll respond with everything there telling you you created that. And by the way, I wrote almost zero lines of code, just a few lines of code to actually make all this happen in the Grails app. Wow. I'll show that in a little bit. Some client app maybe on your mobile phone. Vision of application state. You cannot be true REST unless you do this. And in true REST, you just give like one URL. Think of like the corporate company homepage, you know, something like that, google.com or something like that. You go there, response contains links listing all the possible operations. So you go to a bank and they say, well, here's how to check your balance, here's how to do whatever, here's how to make withdrawals, deposits, things like that. If you think kind of similar to hypertext, similar to your homepages, that's kind of cool, and you say, oh, it's all there, right? But the problem is, you really need a human to read this giant blob of JSON coming back to figure out operations there. Most companies I know of that expose a RESTful API have extensive documentation saying these are the parameters you call, these are all the stuff, so you don't just hit their home, grab the information and try and figure it out yourself from there, right? Usually you document this stuff um, and tell people, this is exactly what you call to make a withdrawal or to check your balance or to do whatever it is your API allows people to do. They're going to ask you questions anyway, so you have to document it no matter what. You just can't get away from it. So, All right. REST is used in real life by a whole lot of companies. Twitter, LinkedIn, Salesforce.com, Jira, which does like bug tickets and um, agile development. There's a whole lot more out there. Um, there's a lot of uh, websites that actually advertise other companies' API sites trying to promote using REST APIs. There's a gazillion places out there. 
Many of these are not true REST, and again, I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't really care. When you're making an API, it's the whole idea is to make it useful for the consumers of the API. Purity is not always useful for the consumers of the API. Right? Let's see if anyone disagrees on that. <laughs> to you over there. <laughs> so why in the world would you use REST? It's easy. It's easy to create your APIs. It's easy to use the APIs. And you can use kind of any programming language you want. Part of the whole idea of the client-server nature of REST is the client doesn't care what the server was written in. The server doesn't care what the cli clients are written in. It all goes over standard HTTP. It's relatively simple for communication. Pretty much any programming language can be used for writing your REST APIs or consuming them. There's JSON libraries in Python, Java, Groovy, pretty much anything out there. Follow the whole .NET side of things. You can use pretty much anything. Grails for REST is a nice alignment of what you have because Grails has extensive REST support. And if you use these defaults they have, it's super easy, but no one really uses the defaults in real life because they're just too simple. And they expose a little bit too much you want. In addition, Grails is really useful for writing any kind of applications, web applications. It reduces your initial software development time significantly, and it reduces your long-term maintenance time because it encourages and supports testing, and it has a lot of features that makes it much easier for long-term maintenance. And that's really the, the main reason. So you, Grails is useful on its own if you're doing web apps or other type of server applications. It's also very useful for Grails. Any questions so far? You going to a little bit on Grails? All right. I'm talking too fast, aren't I? <laughs> so Grails is a Java enterprise application framework. It normally builds to WAR files, and you deploy the Java EE servers. It only needs a servlet container, so Tomcat works fine for it. You can also deploy for WebSphere if you are in for pain and want to spend lots of time. Any other Java EE server out there will work just fine. Newer Grails is moving more towards executable jars with Tomcat embedded inside, much like Spring Boot. So that's kind of where it's moving. Um, you're still going to be able to make a WAR file and deploy to WebSphere. IBM will make sure that's always possible, but it'll just take longer, I think, in the future. <laughs> it does now. Grails is coded in both Java and Groovy. Groovy is a JVM-based language I'll introduce a little bit. It's currently a version 2.4.4, and in March this year, version 3.0 was supposed to come out. So very, very soon we're going to have version 3.0. There's a milestone release already out you can download. It's harder. Just the last few days, they changed the grails.org website, so it's almost impossible to find the download for the next <laughs> major release. I don't know why they hid that, um, but if you dig around, you can find it. Grails has been out there for a long time. Version 1.0 came out in February 2008. And even before then, I did a couple of validation of this. So we get it's proven to be 30% to 45% more productive in real projects and generally even more than that and stuff. You spend a lot less software development time using Grails as opposed to, say, this, doing the same application in just straight Java with Spring, something like that. Still writing enterprise applications, but Grails just makes things much more productive on the software development side. Grails is used by a whole lot of United Health, Nationwide Insurance, Target. There's a whole lot more big companies. Um, it's used all over the place. Grails is built on a proven technology stack. It uses the Springs framework, which has some very nice transaction support. As I said, the next major version will use Spring Boot. I'll have a few slides on that. Grails uses Spring MVC, which is the web tier of Spring. Some people use Spring without Spring MVC. They would use like struts or something like that back in the old days. Grails uses Hibernate by default for database access. It comes with both. Spock is highly recommended. It has a built-in Tomcat for testing your web applications. Grails will automatically do things like inject loggers into your services and your controllers and stuff, so you can just log without any kind of hassle. It also includes an in-memory database called H2, and that's just used for testing. So basically, on this little laptop here, connected to nothing else with Grails, I can have a full technology stack to write an enterprise Java application and test it out and run it. 
I can run it in the built-in Tomcat. I can use the built-in H2 database and test it. But for your local development, you can just do everything just on a work uh, like a laptop or a workstation, something like that. It's really kind of nice. So it comes with the whole stack all built in for all your development information need. Grails really reduces your development time. And a lot of the stuff is, if you think about it, Grails is just lots of little things that speed up your development. You could develop all of this stuff on your own. Obviously, some people did, right, to make Grails. But it just saves you so much time and hassle in doing things. So there's a lot of convention. The new Grails developer will say, I know exactly where the services are located. I know exactly where the controllers are located. I know exactly how to build this app. I know where to find its configuration is. I know where to find all the dependencies that it's based on that it needs. Right there. Any new developer who knows Grails will be able to come on and start figuring this out right away. Think of you're using Ant or Maven or Gradle for your build. They have to figure out, well, what is the way you build the project? Where are the dependencies located? All these other things like that. With Maven, you can have nested POM files and all this stuff. There's just no question. With the Grails app, you know exactly where everything is, just from the get-go, and it's kind of nice. And in the code, something like Maven will say, well, your Java code goes here, but there's no organization defined underneath that. Grails says, here's where your controllers are, here's where your domain objects are, here's where your are, and so you all know exactly where everything's going to be. And this really helps on bringing new developers on. It also helps, you know, kind of exchanging within your organization, knowledge, things like that. Grails uses the active record pattern for database access. I'll have a slide on that. I really like Groovy and find it much more productive than Java. Grails has extensive support for unit testing. One of the things, if you've ever done like a Java Server Faces app, a JSF app, it's really hard to set up a test environment in there. It's gotten easier over the years, but Grails promotes unit testing by reducing the bar of how much effort it takes to start writing tests and getting your app done. And so that encourages people to write a lot more unit tests. More tests typically makes higher quality code. And there are some changes coming in the stuff in Grails 3.0. The configurations are moving to a new location. Um, the build system is changing a bit. But once you do the switch over to 3.0, everything will be standardized on that then. Grails uses a lot of convention over configuration. Grails uses spring auto wiring. So everything in your Grails app domain folder is mapped to database tables. Grails will automatically add in IDs and version numbers on your domain objects. Makes it a lot simpler than Hibernate stuff. Everything in your Grails app services folder are mapped to transactional services. There's a controllers folder bootstrap, and you can have more than one, but the bootstrap is when the app starts up. It can run your bootstrap, and so like for testing, it can populate your in-memory database with some test records, things like that. Um, all kind of standard by the conventions of the Grail stuff. So everyone knows where it is, and it's all built in for you. There's a lot of documentation on Grails. There's books and all sorts of things like that. But also, there's a lot of usage in Minnesota. Grails is used Virtuel, Target, Best Buy, Department of Education. We have some folks here, Department of Health, all sorts of different places. There's a Groovy Users of Minnesota group that covers Grails technologies, Groovy technologies, all these things around that. It's a very, very active group. They get a lot of presentations there. And there's this conference. There's two conferences worldwide every year on Grails that are like the official big conferences. There's great conferences. It's one in Europe and one in the North America. The North America one is here in town every year. And if you haven't heard it before, I really recommend it. It's typically one of the cheaper conferences and much more focused on technical content. So there's not a lot of glitz. You don't get a lot of swag, unlike the JavaScript folks who give you lots of swag. Um, but it's really good conference, a really good value for your money, I find. And you have some of the best people, Grails, from all over the world, including people here, and they give these talks, and it's highly recommended. There's also a lot of documentation online. There's a big extensive Grails user's guide that will guide you through all sorts of stuff. So it's usually easy to get pretty start, get started on this. Grails makes really heavy use of Groovy. 
It's a JVM language that's very similar to Java, a lot less verbose. Who's used Groovy before? Most of you have. All right. So it will support dynamic typing if you want. It will support static typing if you want. Has some nice support in the syntax for maps, lists, regular expressions. Really, really handy. They also extend the code. It, you don't have to open up buffered stream readers and all this other junk like that. Um, it has some nice extensions to the data API, things like that. Groovy integrates very well with Java. You can run Java code. You can access Java classes. You use a .groovy file name extension, which is probably the dorkiest thing about the Groovy language all around, I think. Um, and you compile it to .class files just like Java. So it's very, very similar. There's some dynamic features of Groovy, but you can also have an annotation called at compile static to compile it so it has a little better performance and you, at the sacrifice of a few of the dynamic features. So here's just a few quick examples. Groovy has built-in support for lists. So the top line is just defining a list of two elements. You can actually make it be mixed elements if you want, or you can, instead of using the word def, which is kind of like generic defining that thing, you could say list bracket spring, or st string, sorry, and have a list of just strings. You can use that operator there, the shift operator, to add to your list. Um, it's just, it's a whole lot easier than using the normal Java APIs instead of calling .add, whatever, things like that. Maps are the same way. You have a key, a colon, and then the value. So foo is the key, bar is the value. Maps as well can have um, items of different types in them if you want. And you can access it very similar to map.foo. Sort of like JSTL uses some um, similarities to that. But it's just nice. If you've ever had to f initialize a map in Java code, this is so much better. Here's that one convenience. This one line of code reads a text file in every single line, opens all the streaming buffers and everything like that, closes them all for you, and you get back a list where each element of the list is one more line of the file. Date stuff. You make a new date object, and they override the operators for addition and subtraction. Today plus one is tomorrow. It's just, it assumes that the default there is days. So when you add one to it, it's adding a day to it. That is so much easier than normal Java code for dates even with something like Joe the date, Joe the time. This is one of my favorites. You're always told in Java, never use the double equals operator to compare strings. You're never, ever supposed to do that. But in Groovy, it will call dot equals for you. Take care of that. That is so much easier in writing your code. It's another great favorite, the null safe operator. Normally in Java, if you weren't sure if user is null or user.address is null, you would have to have a very complicated if statement down. But instead, with the question mark dot operator, the null safe operator, it says if user is not null, then check for address. If that's not null, then check for Groovy has a different addition, idea of true and false than Java does. So it's not just strictly Boolean. Something that's not null is true. Something that's null or empty is false. So if you have the street on this user's address object filled in with some value, then you execute that if statement. Otherwise, it will safely go through, and you're not going to be burned. It's very, very handy, much simpler code. It's an Elvis operator. I do not know Elvis, but uh, do any of you guys know it's called Elvis? Oh, OK. So it's form of the ternary operator. So if user.name has a value, if it's not empty and not null, use that as the display name. Otherwise, use anonymous. You could expand out the ternary operator if you want in there, but it's just an easy shortcut to that. Groovy has some really nice things for working with JSON, working with XML. The JSON builder there. You can just give it a map and say, make me a pretty string out of it. Pretty strings have lots of spaces and indentation and extra lines. 
Just regular two string doesn't, so it's a little more smaller packet there. But it's very, very easy to output pretty much anything as JSON or XML. They have XML markup builders. They have JSON slurpers that suck in X, uh, JSON data and parse it for you. It's all very convenient for working with that, and that's very handy for RESTful APIs. A few more quick conveniences. If you have a double-quoted string, you can insert variables in there using that dollar sign curly brace syntax. And that's very, very handy for building up complicated strings or in any kind of string. Every class gets a map-based constructor. So if you see there, we're making a new person object and we're filling in properties on person, first name and last name. Because it's a map-based constructor, you can fill in any properties in any order you want, so you don't have to write so many constructors. In Java, you might, well, here's the constructor with two values, here's the constructor with three values, here's the constructor with four values. With Groovy, you just get that for free, and so you're writing a lot less constructors. Using what's called the spread operator at the bottom there, you can say, I have, people is assumed to be a list of, say, person objects, each of which has a field called name or a method on there called get name and just collect me up all the names from these people. It's very, very handy, although I will warn you, this is, can be a performance issue. We found in some performance testing this can be kind of slow, so you don't always want to use that. Groovy closures. Closures can apply to any kind of collection, and it's basically similar to Java 8 lambdas, although different, because the Java 8 people want to be different. Um, Collect will say, go through my list, apply what's between the curly braces to it, and it just a list of things. So in this case, it's going through the list of one, two, three, multiplying everything by two, so you get two, four, six coming out of it. In Groovy and Gray, find finds the first thing that meets its condition. So go through this list and find the first thing where the value is greater than one. Find all finds everything that meets the condition. The dot each is similar to a for each. It just loops through a collection. It's very, very nice. I find closures are really handy when you do something like, here, go execute this query against the database, and then for each row returned, execute this block of code. That's where closure is going to be really, really handy. Right. Well, if you don't want to break out of it, it doesn't matter, right? right. Um, it's shorter syntax than doing a for each, although you could argue that too much. Um, I've been using, there's a, a parallelization library called gpars, and they have a dot each parallel that basically every item in the list and fires it off in a separate thread and executes that block of code of the closure on that. So it's a very, very handy dot each there. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do the null safe operator. You could do your list, question mark, dot each, and it won't go into the thing if there's no items there. But you can argue it's just syntactic sugar anyway, right? <laughs> All right, so jumping from Groovy to some of the better features of Grails, there's something called GORM. GORM is your object relational ma mapper for Grails. It's based on Hibernate. It supports most relational databases, your Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, all sorts of things like that. It does support a few NoSQL databases. MongoDB is probably the primary one with the greatest amount of support out there. It gives you easy transaction support. And similar to Hibernate or JPA, if you use like entity classes, it maps a database table to a domain class. Only it's a whole lot easier than Hibernate or JPA directly because there's a lot of conventions there. Every column in the domain class is mapped, or every property in the domain class is mapped to a column in the database table. And it will also do things, it will make an ID using the native ID format for a generated ID of that database, like Oracle, the row is updated, and that helps prevent concurrent modifications. You can also use a timestamp for version if you want. 
Grails comes with this in-memory H2 database, and there's a very nice feature. If you haven't seen some of the newer versions of Grails, you might have missed it. There's a DB console, and so when you run your app, you just use that URI DB console and actually shows you the database structure right there. So it shows you it's taken your Hibernate mappings from your domain objects, mapped them to tables. It's particularly interesting for join tables. And it just shows you all the tables in your database. You can fire off queries against it, all sorts of things like that. Very, very useful for debugging in development. Grails uses the active record pattern. This comes from... Well, for a long time, it's been in the literature. Ruby on Rails is probably the biggest thing that promoted this. You basically make a domain object, a new person, Bob Johnson, and you just call save on it. Normally, you'd wrap this in a transaction, but you don't have to write a DAO object at all. You don't have to write any of those classes for, for persisting things. You also don't have to know if it's an update or an insert. Save just takes care of it. Yeah, if you put it in a service, it will be in a transaction, um, unless you turn off the transaction on the service. Um, you can also use like a with transaction block. There's a bunch of things like that. The problem with this is that uh, Grails will sometimes auto-generate code for you that don't put things in transactions and puts the code in the controllers like it shouldn't. And so I always warn people, you really should use a transaction. The list method on your domain class is automatically created for you. This allows you to get query all the rows of that table with pagination built in. So this says, I want the next 20 rows of this table starting at offset 10, sort by the last name. And it'll give you back that query for you. You don't have to write any of the code to make the query. You don't have to write the list method. It just magically makes it for you. There's a few other dynamic finder methods. And it uses the standard conventions of find by, finds the first one it comes across in whatever is the database order. <laughs> find all by, finds all of them. So if I say person.findall by last name, pass it Johnson, I guess it might be Minnesotans. You can also combine two uh, queries in there, but you can do things like find all by date created between the first date and the second date. You don't have to write code for any of these methods. It just automatically makes them for you. Here's an example of a domain class. You'll see it's a lot simpler. There's no JPA or Hibernate annotations here anywhere. This maps person. By default, will map to a table called person. First name will map to first underscore name. Same with last name. The date created and last updated are magic names. If you put those in there, Grails with the GORM will automatically keep the dates for you. Every time you update it, the last updated will be modified. So you don't have to putz with that at all. It just takes care of it. The constraints down there are used for two things. You can use it to validate the object. So if you're trying to write out a name, the first name can only be 30 characters long. In addition, if you let Hibernate create the schema for you, it will use that information. This will be a varchar 30. You can. There's a DB, there's a reverse engineer plugin. Although, I have to warn you, there are certain things where it comes out kind of funny. At Department of Education, we had a view on a mainframe table that actually didn't have keys defined. I think that was the thing. So when I ran that, it just basically said your composite key is every single column combined together. And you got like a big mess coming out of it on that. So, but you can actually auto-create that stuff. Again, Hibernate on the hood. So it's pretty much everything that's in Hibernate, which is a little simpler front end on top of it. You can relate domain classes. So a one-to-many unidirectional thing would be a company has many employees. And if you want to make it bi-directional, you go to the employee class and say it belongs to a company. Using that DB console I mentioned, you can put all this in in a simple Grails project and see exactly how it's going to do the joins and what that's going to look like. You can try just the unidirectional first and then go um, bidirectional. As with Hibernate, you can create mappings that are super complicated and super slow for querying. You can shoot yourself in the foot with the technology all you want, so you want to be careful on that. Um, but it's very handy. I'm going to jump topics here. I'm trying to just give a 
quick overview of some of the Grail stuff. Grail supports plugins, and a plugin is like a library, like a jar file, but it contain anything that you can put in the Grails project into an application. So it can have your cascading style sheets, your images, JavaScript. It can contain a whole lot of extra jars and lot other libraries. You can write these to modulize your code, so shared code in your organization can be put into a plugin. Pretty much everywhere I go, that's what we're doing. We're writing one or two plugins for shared code. You can also get all sorts of additional plugins that are out there. Grails.org slash plugins has a whole huge list of plugins. Spring Security is one of the biggest ones. Pretty much almost everyone uses that to like lock down your apps for login security. Supports basic auth. LDAP, all these sorts of other fun things like that. Um, there's a fields plugin that you can use to customize your web user interface. It's not good enough for production, but if you're writing like an administrator app, sometimes that's close enough and you can just use that. With the fields plugin, you can customize it a bunch more, add your company's look and feel to it, add in, say, accessibility type items. That's one of the things I did at Department of Education. So for an administrative UI, we could generate about 80% of the user interface. We have to tweak a little bit, but not too much. There's a DB Migrations plugin that manages your schema changes. So normally with Grails, you can start out, let Hibernate create your schema for you. You can then make all sorts of changes because there's a really low cost to making changes. You just change a domain object and bingo, your scheme is changed for you. But as you get closer to production, you may want to take a look at what the schema is generated and have like a DBA go over it or something like that. And then when you actually get into production, you say, hey, this is my database. I want to lock it down. DB migrations can then be used to say, I'm adding new features which changes the database and it will output a change record for how to update the production database to the new changes you gave in. And that the change record is actually source code, so you can commit that to your source code with the actual changes to the functionality of the code all together. It's just a front end on a lot of other libraries and things. So yeah, it has all the pluses and minuses of Liquibase, plus a little friendlier front end on top of it. There's other simple plugins to like create fake data if you have a complicated object tree and you want to do unit testing on it, you can say just fill in valid values all the way around here of just stuff. It takes care of it for you. There's lots, lots more. Grails really promotes writing tests, helps make your code higher quality. And Grails does use a slightly different terminology than everyone else, so I always have to remind this. It's stupid, but you just that's just the way Grails did it. So unit tests just run the code like one class under test. An integration test spools up the Grails environment so it looks at your configurations. The services can actually talk to databases rather than being mocked out, and it runs tests there. Everyone else in the world of software development, an integration test is what you do at the very end of your project, and you make sure that this app can talk to all the other apps out there on your network. That's not this. This is just spooling up the Grails environment and running tests against that. A functional test is when you actually bring up the whole Grails web application and you start hitting it over HTTP with a test. You can use Jeb, Selenium, Spock Functional, all sorts of different technologies like that. Grails comes with JUnit 4 built in, comes with Spock built in. If you haven't heard of Spock, you want to use it. It's like the best thing for writing tests. Grails 3.0 will bring in Jeb as well for functional tests. Here's a JUnit test. You use an at test for, tells it what you're testing. You make a class with JUnit. Your test methods start with the word test. That can actually change if you use the JUnit annotations. And then at the you set up some data, and then you check your expected result. Very similar to the documentation on that. Um, we've had a lot of talks on Spock, and there's blog posts on the Object Partners website also on Spock. So Spock... The name of the method is actually computing the maximum of two numbers. You can actually, with Groovy, use a whole string like that with spaces. And Spock uses that when it reports errors coming out. It uses that as part of the reporting, so you have a nice little message there of what test failed. Then they have these blocks of expect, and in this case, where. Where is passing a set of data, and it just calls the test method over and over again with all the different values. 
runs that expect condition, and if it's not true, the test will fail. If it's true, the test will pass. So if you ever use something like fitness or other techniques like that, you can make like a table of these are all the inputs and my expected outputs. So for example, we had one where users enter the location into a website and it geolocates, you get like a lat long for that, and then it tries to figure out what stores are nearby and whether the products you're interested are in those stores. Well, the problem is, is these geolocation services can take some characters and not others. So you can build a nice little Spock test. Here's some of the forbidden characters. Does my validator for, forbid them or not, basically, right? Um, and for the strangest reason, it would exist characters, but not Icelandic or something weird like that, the, the Bing geolocator. I do not know why. Just, just weird little quirks in there. This type of test is really handy for that. Spock is just excellent. Now, you've been waiting for, sorry we've been taking so long, Grails has built-in support for REST. One of the things you can do is annotate a domain object as a REST endpoint. Haha, -ha, you're done. It really doesn't work like that in real life. Um, you can do it, but it, chances are you're not going to want to. In the URL mappings, they have a nice resource thing. I will get to that. They have a base class called RESTful Controller that can do an awful lot of the work of this. Grails can automatically detect incoming requests. Are they asking for XML or JSON? Things like that, so you know how to respond. And there's a lot of conversion, automatic conversion of objects to XML or JSON, and you can customize if you need to. I find wherever I go, the requirements are so specific, I always have to customize things. I can never just use the defaults, unfortunately. So here's the shortest amount of code you can write. Import Grails REST resource, at resource, that's it. This is now a RESTful endpoint. It supports gets, it supports puts, it supports posts, it supports deletes. It's all right there. That's all your code. Seems wonderful, doesn't it? So here's an example. If I do a get on employee slash one, it returns XML. For some reason, the default is XML. The default is JSON. But if you add a dot JSON on there, it will op output the JSON. I will point out that I don't like it puts the class name when it does an automatic conversion to JSON, and I'll show you in a little bit how to get rid of that. But all of that's all you have to do. You get a working app just from that. Now, the problem with this, I've never had a use for this in a real application. I don't want to expose my database structure to the world. Some are not. So usually you just can't leave it like that. But if you could, that's it. You're done, right? You probably need to create a controller. So one of the things you'll do with the controller is in the URL mappings and grails, if you use that word resource, I highlight in blue there, what that says is anything coming in with slash company and an ID maps to the controller called company, the company controller, okay? And what that will do is it'll map these HTTP methods to those controller actions. So get will go to an action called show. Post will go to save, which is by expecting to save a new object. Put will do update, and delete will call delete. Now what this is, is in Grails for years when working with databases, those have been the standard controller methods that you've been using. So in Grails, you just do a get on a particular object with an ID. It will, you'll call the show method, and it will then display your object. And stuff. So this resource mapping basically allows you to use the type of controllers you've been using in Grails already with the expectations that Grails developers have, and it just automatically maps it all for you. It takes it for you all, any of your standard CRUD operations. It's pretty nice. You can then manually create a controller. Now, with a controller that you're manually writing, you're going to need to parse the inputs. The inputs might be JSON or XML if they're doing a post. Sure. So you well, then you need to do it yourself with your own custom mappings. Okay. So this is basically assuming you allow the standard type of CRUD operations on there. One line in your URL mapping takes care of it all. Otherwise, you can do a separate line in each URL mapping to a different controller action.
by default you actually get a mapping for you know the action map just by the name that you put on the URL and that's the control Yes, yes. There is a default mapping on there. I find the projects I get are so special case that we're always doing custom mappings. <laughs> and, and that's not nothing to do with the technology. It has to do with the requirements I get. Uh -huh. So with this, if you write your own controller, there's a closure block called with format that will take the input accept headers and determine what format you ask for. So if I have a show thing, so this is trying to show one object, it gets in an ID in the parameters, reads in the person object from the database, and then if the user asks for JSON, you render your object as JSON. If they ask for XML, you render it as XML. In this case, we only support those two formats. So we render an error if they ask for anything else. This is very, very handy where you don't, you could parse accept headers on your own. You can look at all that stuff. This just takes care of it for you. You just know it. This is using the default or registered renderers to XML or JSON. Here's something called RESTful controller that goes even further. This is a base class. You tell it which formats you're going to support. And XML and JSON seem to be the most common formats out there. There's other formats. You can do custom company application specific formats if you want. These are just seems to be the most common. So with this controller, this company controller, you need to give it a domain object to its constructor, and that's all you really need to do. Once you do that, it takes care of everything else you want to do. So if you send it a packet of JSON with a post, it will make a new object for you. If you send it a packet of XML with a put, it will automatically update that object for you. It takes care of all of that stuff. It's really kind of nice. Now, if you agree with its conventions, it takes care of all the work for you. It doesn't always agree. It's not always that easy. And one of the things I found, the controller wants to use the methods show and save and things like that as a real pain. So version number to your REST resource. So this is version one person as opposed to version two person, version three person. This allows you in the future to change your API without breaking the old clients and stuff. You do that in your URL mappings. Now you can customize your REST URL controller. It's a base class. You can override any of the methods you want. And you can also customize the XML and JSON rendering. Grails can render pretty well almost any domain class to XML or JSON. Here's an example. I really don't like the JSON renderer it includes your class name. I don't want to expose what technology I'm using. I mean, this if you see something like that, a class name, it tells you pretty much it's like C Sharp, Java, Grail, Groovy, something like that. It tells you something about it. I don't want to tell people stuff. There's security issues, right? So this is what I don't want to have. So here's the absolute simplest way to register an object marshaller for that domain class company and say, this is what I want out. This is using Grail's built-in syntax for a map. So it's basically just returning a map, which then the JSON renderer will just automatically make into a JSON coming out. So I just want to return the ID and the name and skip everything else like that. You just make this call once in your app. Anything that's executed on startup, the bootstrap is the easiest place to put it. But since Grails apps are spring apps, you can do a spring context initializing bean or something like that and put it in there. There's other ways you can write full-blown object marshallers for JSON or XML. This is the absolute simplest. makes it just a whole lot easier. Typically in Grails, you would use something like Spring Security, and you put you can put the secured annotation on the controller. So that would say no one can execute your controller without these roles. Now sometimes though, you may want to have more permissive use of get. I, people can see data, but they can't change data. You need to override the methods of the RESTful controller and put your annotations on there. So it's, I find the magic is great, but almost never you can use all the magic as is, right? You always have to customize something. Um, 
for the hate OAS stuff, you have link for JSON output. And that will have an underscore links element in your JSON output that has the links to other operations you can do. Atom is another standard XML, though, and that will have an entry with link elements in there. With that, you can use these renders if you want. These are base classes you can use. Um, and it will do this. Again, I find the hate OAS stuff you, mostly useful for paginating your results. So you have a link. Here's the previous page. Here's the next page in the output. Other than that, you tend to have to have someone just scan through all the XML or JSON output and try and figure out what your API is trying to do. No, it comes in, so you say, my page is starting at offset 10, and I'm grabbing 20 elements. So you put those numbers in the links. So the state is in your output, so the client has to give you back the state. No, 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 not with the session at all. So I can say, yeah, so in the URL... I can say start at position, say, 30, and give me 20 records. Okay, so previous link is start at position 10 and give me 20 records. The next link is start at position, let's see if I can do the math here, 50 and give me 20 records. So in your output, you say here's the link to the next, here's the link to the previous, and all those numbers are there in the URL. So then the client can just take that and f feed that back. So spring and spring or Grails 3.0, and they're really big. It's still in a pre-release format. There's a milestone release out right now you can get. Grails 3.0 is going to be built on top of Spring Boot. Spring Boot is another set of technologies built on top of Spring, and it's designed in part with the idea of conventions over some of the configuration type stuff. Spring Boot is considered an opinionated framework. It decides your application is supposed to look like this, and then it's built on top of standard Spring. Some of the neat things in Spring Boot is it assumes that your app is going to build to a runnable jar. It will include Tomcat inside the jar, so you just do java-jar on your jar file, and your app starts up just like that. Fires it off. Now, the WebStreet people are bummed out about that, of course. Not everyone else likes that. Now, some of the changes for Grails. Grails has had configuration stored in one known location, and from there it tells you what all the other locations are. This is changing with Spring Boot. Grails is going to start using Spring Boot's idea of configurations, which you can use the normal groovy stuff like you've been using. You can put it in YAML. You can put it in an application context XML file like old ancient spring. You can put it in properties files, and you can put it in classes marked with an annotation that they're part of your configuration. It's going to use boot dependency specifications. Really, it's going to use Gradle. Gradle is going to be using for building it, and your dependencies are going to go there instead of in your build config, which you do today. In Spring Boot, because it's an embedded executable, or Grails 3.0 will have that in there with your main. The Grails API itself has changed a whole lot. They're using something called traits. Traits are a form of allowing for multiple inheritance, but are not mix-ins, because mix-ins are the old technology in Groovy to allow for multiple inheritance. <laughs> and traits are better. Um, but the, the basic Grails API, if you call any of the Grails code itself, are going to be built using traits. They have a lot better IDE in the integration. And a big thing of this, anyone who does Grails uses IntelliJ. IntelliJ costs money. There's a free community edition of IntelliJ that specifically does not support Grails because they want you to pay money. But now with Grails 3.0, you're just building a Java app with a main method, and you can just run it. So you can select that main method and run it in the community edition of IntelliJ, and it will run just fine. So people will rejoice who don't have corporate support to buy the commercial <laughs> great development part. It also is better supported in Eclipse and NetBeans. Um, all your building is going to be built on Gradle. 
You're still going to have a Grails command, so a lot of the stuff is going to work the same, but the dependencies and other operations will be defined in Gradle. Gradle is, think of it as like the next generation of Ant with nice Maven-type dependency features in there without that is Maven. Um, Jeb is a big system for writing functional tests. There's a lot of documentation around that. And this solves a problem. For a while now, pretty much every Grails technology for functional tests was deprecated in terms of something else that was then deprecated in terms of something else that was then deprecated. Jeb is now going to be part of standard Grails. It's going to come with it, and you're going to be able to write your functional tests in that. Other functional test technology will still work, but it's nice to have that. Just like when Grails brought in Spock a few versions ago, and then every rest. Cookbook.com is one of the best places to get a short snippets about rest without having to read the whole thing here. You can look up Roy T. Fielding and his paper and find a link for that, and good luck. Stack Overflow, as always, has good descriptions of what is rest. Grails.org is where you get all the information on Grails. Object Partners, we have a blog. A lot of our blog posts cover individual elements of Grails, Gradle, Groovy, all sorts of Spring Boot, all sorts of other technologies out there. Recommend that. And I have a short little thing on installing Grails. You just download a zip, unzip it, set Grails home, and you're done. There's also a really sweet tool called GVM, which is used originally for managing different versions of Grails on like different projects. GVM can download and install Grails for you, and then you can easily switch between them. GVM also supports downloading Spring Boot, Groovy versions, all sorts of other technologies there. It's a real handy command line tool. So you, I can say um, on my projects, we have like a Grails 2.2, Oh, Grails 2.2.4 um, app. So you can say GVM, use Grails 2.2.4. It'll switch to that as your default version of Grails. But most of my new projects are using Grails 2.4.4, the latest official version. GVM, use Grails 2.4.4. It's a really nice command line tool to just switch between versions of Grails, um, versions of Groovy, versions of other technology you want to use. It supports Gradle, all sorts of different things. Um, so it's a really nice way to download. Is there any other questions? I I wouldn't care on that. I would wait for 301, to tell you the truth. Just any new technology like that, wait for the first bug fix release. Um, the documentation isn't all there yet. There's a milestone one release out now. It's been out for a while. Um, I have a feeling it's going to come out because they're all rushing to finish it um, in March. But I would, again, I would wait to the 301 before making the big switch over. If you're doing Grails apps now, you should be aware of what are some of the changes coming up, what you'll need to do, because things like your configuration will be in a new place, the build dependencies, things like that. Um, Grails 3.0 will give some other nice features from Spring Boot. They have something they call actuators, which are sort of production-ready features. There's like a health check URL you can get built in. Um, they can expose your configuration. You'd want to only administrators. But what I find with lots of different server environments in like a stage environment, a production environment, whatever, you oftentimes get these questions of, how is that app really configured? What are the back-end systems it's really trying to talk to? Because I'm seeing a behavior I don't expect. Like, it seems like it's talking to the stage database, not the production database, because I'm getting a lot less records than I expect coming back. So these actuator features allow you to expose the configuration, all the different configuration values, how it interpreted it as configuration, um, things like that. You said that comes with Spring Boot? Yes. So you'll get that for free with Grips. Nice. Again, you don't want to expose that to the people in Bulgaria or Philippines or whoever is hacking your system, right? You want to put some security on that if you put it on the Internet. Anything else? Do you characterize, sorry, go ahead. Do you characterize Ruby as jQuery for Java? There's no dollar signs. That would be Ruby <laughs> with those the dollar sign underbar stuff. Um, Groovy is just a whole lot easier to use than Java. It's just less verbose. 
It's simpler, but it compiles to dot class files. You can call it jQuery if you want. jQuery is old technology, though, now, too, right? Is that answered enough? <laughs> okay. I was going to say, when the, when the new one comes out, what I've found is in the past, it breaks a lot, of, and it sounds like it's a big enough change, but a lot of plugins break. And one of the big advantages is to be able to use all these plugins that are out there. So I always find it, I have to wait a little while for the plugins. Yep, that makes sense. There's a list already of all the plugins they've offered. Again, I'd wait to the... 301, whatever is at least the first bug fix version of that, just because it's such a big change. So you, you say they get rid of the build config file? Yeah, so that moves just to your Gradle, your Gradle.properties. That will define all your dependencies. Or or your, your what was it, build.gradle, sorry. That's what it was going to be. When you said the configurations get changed, what gets lost in there? So the configurations are either in a new location and you can use the, the groovy style configurations you've been doing. Or Spring Boot supports YAML, which is a format store like XML, right? Only without all the curly the the brackets. Style? Is that what we yeah, that? yep. Okay. Yep. And it can also support your application XML from old Spring stuff. And then Spring Boot introduces the concept of an at configuration on a class, and the class itself returns configuration values, hard-coded in there. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Thank you. So, and that just comes with Spring Boot. You get all these choices for different stuff. Um, ideally, you'd pick one and do that, but I've seen applications that use them all. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, I see someone nodding back there. <laughs> He knows what I'm referring to. Um, anything else? Any comments on the changeover with Pivotal dropping? Sort of? Grails existed for a long time without one big consulting firm that was owned by some huge military defense contractor. Um, so it's going to continue on just fine. Um, and I have a feeling the main Grails developers and the main Groovy developers are going to find employment in a variety of different companies. So some are like in France, some are in Britain, some are in the U.S. here. Um, I don't know if any major companies could come in and say we're going to hire the whole team, but you've got companies such as like Netflix making heavy use of Grails. They're going to hire a few of these people because they're really good developers, right? So what Pivotal did is they hired these people, but they also wanted them to do services, right? consulting services. That's how Pivotal made its money, right? So they might work for a consulting company. Before there was Pivotal, there was G21, which was a Grails Groovy specific consulting firm that was then bought by the Spring Source folks, that was then bought by some big company, bought by a bigger company, bought by EMC and stuff, and then it's called, made into it's called Pivotal. So I, did, I don't think that's going to impact it too much. It may mean some people aren't going to be spending as much time on Grails as they used to, but the technology has been out there for years. It's open source. People are going to keep making it go because it's so useful. That's why, you know. Anything else? Well, I've seen people like just Spring Boot with. You can use either Java or Groovy with Spring Boot and skip the Grail stuff. Um, so that's one competing framework. In the Groovy world, there's something called Rat Pack for microservices. Uh, that's not as old as Grails, not as, not as established. It doesn't use the full technology stack. Um, in the whole world of Windows, you can get locked down in the Microsoft technologies. You can try and use Mono on non-Microsoft technologies if you trust that in a few years Microsoft won't come and sue the underpinnings of that away, like they did with the Win32 API on Unix and Linux that they sold long ago. Um, so there's Django for Python. There's all sorts of different things, right? Grails has mostly been a thin wrapper on top of Spring and Hibernate, so it really is Spring and Hibernate with extra features and stuff. Does it make dependency injection easier than Spring? 
It uses the auto wiring, so you don't have to say this is at auto wired or anything like that. It will automatically pop the things in there. So it's slightly easier. Generally, it finds things by name or type and just puts it in for you. So your controller has services. The services may have other services. If you do do Java and Spring Boot, get ready for annotations. <laughs> you might have 15 times on every class coming out of there. Anything else? Hopefully this is useful to you. Hopefully you saw some of what's in the technology. And hopefully Grails can make you more productive. And if you still don't trust it, I was very, very skeptical of Grails when I first tried it. After the first project, I said I never want to go back. Never again. All right. Thanks.